Okay, great. Here we are again, back from spring break. I mean, Linux user, the, the log, the GNU and Linux user group at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Let's go ahead and move into the group updates. So I've been working on documentation here um, for all our services. So this will hopefully get you up and running so you can actually use it. I'm just using Markdown, so it's real simple. Uh, here's the pages, all links from the main readme. You can be like, oh, I want to check out the GitLab. And then there's the actual, here's the host. And here's how to add your keys. And here's how to set up your configuration so that you can pull from the host. Here's how to use HTTPS. So all of this stuff is documented here. If you want to use our Tor Provoxy service, Here's how you can set up your local system to actually tunnel through that. Um, here's uh, going to work on the website. Oh, uh, we also have a, I don't know if I mentioned this, we do have our own package repository now, a cacher and actual repository. We have packages. So this is how you set up your machine. And I do have it now so that it's publicly accessible. So if you want to have your own packages hosted here that you want to have on your machines and you don't want to have to compile it or carry it around with you, just copy to our server. And then follow this documentation on how to how to run it. So essentially, you drop in a directory and you run this command essentially, and um, then you can actually add that our repository to your machine, and you can add dash get install your stuff from wherever you are from our system. So that's kind of nice. Um, so anyway, that's the documentation. There's a bunch more. Um, I got the documentation of what we'll be talking about tonight too, Graphite and Grafana. Um, we do have a new system, and this is grafana.gnu.log.org. It's also influxdb.gnu.log.org. They're all C names, and they point to the actual host, docker1.gnu.log.org. So all three refer to each other. And it's our, our first Docker system, and it's running a, a container for Grafana and a container for influxdb. And we'll get into that into the talk today. Also, um, RMS Roundup, we're going to have a discussion about the uh, Richard's uh, installment talk. Anyone have any comments on that? Um, I think um, having been in the car with him for four plus hours, one thing I could say is that he doesn't like to talk about technology. I don't know if he gets asked those same questions a lot. Like I said in the past, he would just like reset a URL for a particular question, such as what is your favorite Linux distribution or what do you use or what um, is your particular view on this, like System D, for example. And those are all shut down fairly quickly. Um, but I think to be fair to him, it was annoying in the car because it kind of hampered discussion. But to be fair to him, I guess in a sense, uh, he, it's probably best that he, being at his at his level or his stature, not giving favoritism to any particular distribution or to the things such as System D. Uh, or he, and he, but I think he actually said since he didn't have any knowledge on it, so he didn't want to comment, which is fair. So those are fine. Granted, there's definitely some intricacies with his personality that uh, made the trip um, uncomfortable. What would you say? Did you pick him up in Chicago? Yeah, we went to pick him up in Chicago. He had to stay with his friend, um, which is interesting. And then he had us run a few errands for him, which we were just expecting to get back. So like, I was expecting to do a half day of work. But it ended up being a full day because we had to take him to the grocery store. We had to help him find a, a, a place to repair his camera in downtown Chicago. Uh, or not downtown, but some of the busy areas. Chicago was car all the way behind us, and he's like, "Go oh, slower, slower, so we could actually see the the, the actual um, the, uh, the 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 actual places on the the actual sorry the actual stores for uh, camera repair." We're like looking, like, there's one down here somewhere. Wayland was going so slow, and he kept going to go slow that the people behind us were honking, like because like pound cars behind us from Chicago on a busy road. It was it was it was funny. And then he he requested to go to a bookstore, which I mean, I enjoyed that. Went to Jane Addams downtown Champagne. You guys are like, awesome. It is awesome. It's really cool. There is tons of good stuff yeah. in there. Like I was looking at the philosophy and political science section. There was all kinds of cool yeah. stuff. I'll definitely go back there. Me too. So that was one of the benefits of the trip was having him recommend that you wanted to do that. Um, other things, um, he, he, his personality was. I know there was some speculation on the internet whether he he has Asperger's or not. I, I went around. I looked at I looked at some talks and uh, stuff online. And I, I'm 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 inclined to believe that's probably true, uh, but I do I mean I do appreciated uh, his hit him to actually come speak for us, and he he had a great talk and so it was, I love the Emacs thing at the end. You guys, that was really funny. So it was it was an experience. I'm glad I got to meet the guy. Um, it was a lot of work too though, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that concludes our Mr. Unless you guys have anything to say about it, you guys, what do you guys think about the whole experience? 
Anything? I mean, there's little points that I didn't always agree with what he said, but right. things he's accomplished by being so hard edged about everything right. that he couldn't, he, he couldn't have done what he did without being so idealistic and and un, unbending. So it's right. just phenomenal. So yeah. I really enjoyed seeing him see him talk. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really cool to meet him in person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm glad we were, I mean, I was able to do that. So that was fun. Um, yep, that's the roundup. We're going to go ahead and move into the meeting sections. Um, First off, Kitematic or Kitematic is a Docker GUI that joins uh, the Docker family. So essentially, uh, there's a company who created this thing that allows you to have a GUI for Docker on OS 10. And I was actually going to hopefully play with it over break, but I did not get a chance to. But it looks really interesting. I went and pulled the website. I'm sorry, guys, I'm making some noise. I'm very, very hungry. Um, Thank you. I say Simon, I meant Sam, sorry. Um, okay. So, let's take a look at the webpage here. So, yes, this is the GUI, and they have a picture of it here, so you can actually quickly and easily run Docker containers on OS X. And since it's not native this world, right, the kernel doesn't have namespace and C groups, it actually just runs them into your virtual machine, like, kind of like Fuji Docker, but you have a your interface for it. Um, VirtualBox 3.2.6 was released. Let's take a look at that. And I don't know if there's anything particular. Um, some bug fixes. Looking for features here. Oh, looks like all bug fixes. We have maintenance release right here. So, FYI, uh, Linux one or Linux containers usually in tools. 1.1.1 one one was released. Um, so they have uh, you can fuse file system from templates. Oh, proc net is now writable. Interesting. Um, a few other options here. TTY issues with attachment, etc. Yeah, I've been wanting to do more with LX uh, C tools. I'm use, mostly using Docker for my runtime. I have used it in the past, but I definitely get like my, my program Islet supported for this too. Um, so it relies on more than one runtime. Another thing is SSH. Open SSH 6.8 was released, and one notable thing was, or two notable things, one is that use DNS now defaults to no, and they actually support two keys now. You can do it. You can set up with two public keys. And where is that at? One second. I didn't go through this whole list, but um, search for two. Yes. So remember when public keys have been used for authentication and refuse to accept previously used keys, but it also allows authentication methods equal public key that are common public keys to require users to authenticate using two different public keys. So maybe this could be a use case where you have a shared public key among your team, and then you have a private one. So it's, you know, there's two levels of authentication. Also, like just a guess. I don't know if anybody's using this, but this is brand new. It just came out. So that's the use case that I can immediately think about whenever I see this. But that's something that's interesting. Um, GitHub. Oh, there's your soup. Hey, man, how's it going? Hey, good. How are you? Good. So um, next we have GitHub announced they have PDF viewing on their interface now. So if there's a PDF in there, you can see in this repository there has one. You can click on it and it will actually load in the preview section. Um, so that's kind of nice. So you want to download it and check it out. Uh, also, um, there was this Unix clone called Coherent that was open source. So that's kind of interesting. I've never heard of it before. Um, I don't know if it's, it was a System 5 clone. I'm not real sure. Um, but you can check out the source here. It's all in this tarball at Nesso Software. So you check that out if you're interested in it. Um, also, uh, TrueCrypt, the audit was completed. If you guys remember uh, when there was uh, some compromise in TrueCrypt, and on their website anyway, if I remember correctly, and there was also speculation that maybe TrueCrypt is indeed back to order or something. But this uh, cryptographer right here, actually did, did, worked on the audit himself, and I guess the big takeaway here is the too long, don't read. 
TrueKit appears to be a relatively well-designed piece of crypto software. So the NCC audit found no evidence of deliberate backdoors or any severe design flaws that will make the software insecure in most instances. So that's good to hear, because a lot of people were depending on that piece of software. And if you're interested in more information, do check out this blog post. Uh, so this tool I came across on the I think an email list or a mailing list somewhere, but uh, it's called How Do I? It gives you instant coding answers via the command line. So you just give it some strings and it tries to print like how I get the database, how you think it would do something like how do I you format the date in bash and it gives you an example of how to format it. Also, um, yes, yeah, this one's funny. Um, how do I create a tar archive? I'll give you an example using exclude and creating the archive and naming it. So that's kind of cool. Do check this out. I'm not sure if it's, any, if it's any, in any package repositories, but it's on GitHub right here. So the installation. Is it just a big self contained like, database? Or is it like a Python access script? Access pages? It's a Python script. Um, question. That's uh, right. Where's it pulling it from? Search URL. Oh, it looks like it queries the website. This website. Well, no, that's for Google. Wait, uh, how do I? No. Oh, is it actually pulled from? Yeah, it looks like it pulls from. If I can, um, no Python there. I do. You can see this in a quick, brief uh, example. But it looks like it pulls from um, Google. Yeah. Yep, so it's using the string. So it's going, to, it's going to like grab whatever's in the, in the result. That's kind of cool. So I wonder if it's random each time. I don't know. Um, need a further look at that. We'll go ahead and move on. So that's kind of cool. Do check that out. Um, nothing for prop period, nothing for SH section. So I was playing around. There was a discussion on Facebook of how to hide a process on the system if you want to do like a malicious binary. So if you compromise the system, how do you hide stuff? And I was kind of, I was kind of like, well, how can we do this without writing a program into the without you know uh, trying to exploit some vulnerability or untouched from the process table or whatever. Um, something more simple than something like that. And I was like, well, I was sort of looking through the bash manual page and the exec has a specific option. Let's go ahead and go over here. Bash exec. And we can see that's too big. We can see that. So, exec by itself, it replaces the current process. And in the case of the shell, it will print, replace the shell with the new process. But we're looking for the, the argument. I wish my I wish there's a way to do a highlighting or make a change in the, the cursor color. But I'm looking for because I can't really see it on here. I'm looking for this dash a. If we look at the the actual um, definition of it, I assume I see dash a. Yeah. It's the shell spec uh, passes name as the zeroth argument. Okay, right. So the zeroth argument with the program name. So what we can do is just to demo this. Let's go around what I came up with. So this the attack here is um, you're on a you're on a system. You want to cat everything in edge that you want to get other configuration files, including password and shadow, right? And then you want to, since most systems have netcat installed, you want to take that data and pass it to netcat. It will then connect to computer place. This, this local host, this is my example, with the actual server that you want to connect to, like your server, on this port, and then you would like, you know, with the NetCat prop listener on that on that other host, your host, NetCat L, like 444, and then you use the redirection operator to run to a file, and then all that stuff that you can will then be written to a file for that. Um, what this actually does replaces all this with dash, I uh, don't mind me, so you can. Uh, You might have to. Um, I'll have to put something in here and make it uh, sleep ten, and then we'll do p or p grab uh, Oh, that's not what I to try to p Damn it! What happened this time? Um, yeah, I didn't. That sleep did not complete. That was. That's not the time. Why did I do that? Should be sleeping, and then it should be echoing that or that kind of idea to there. Um, yeah, hold on. 
Let's just let's just do it a different way. Let's do this. Pretend just to demo it. That should no, no, no. What the hell is wrong? I did this a bunch of times. Hold on. Uh, let's see if I got the right history. What does it mean? Have a space. Um, well, I think they're doing different things. The one with sleep in it is uh, substituting a file. Okay. Wait, is this the other one's just standard reading. Okay. Uh, oh, damn it. So that's for replacing the shell and Oh, yeah, that was bad. That was a bad move. I literally replaced the shell. That worked that time. You waited 10 seconds and it replaced the shell. Okay, so. Um, sorry, guys. I did this like four weeks ago and uh, haven't tested since, so forgive me if I don't remember exactly how this works. Um, solarized dark. Uh, All right, we're going to get this though. All right, so this one will demonstrate. This should demonstrate it. So, um, oh wait, I think I'm gonna have to do something. Well, either way, I don't have to do it. I don't have to be tricky like that. I, I should be able to do it. Well, no, no, no. Yeah, that's going to kill. Here, I can just demo this. Uh, if I can type fast enough. There it is. Okay. That's what I wanted to show you. You want to remember the details. But um, so, ah, God damn it. <laughs> because that, one, that window die, right? Because we replaced the process of the shell with what we exec. And we exec, we exec sleep 10. So it literally removes that process memory and replaces this new one in, in its place. And it's similar to the, it's pretty much the same thing as the exec VE system call. And in this particular case, we're in a new window we ran that, which is what I should have been doing, um, which I think that's why it didn't work. Well, I don't know why it didn't background, but um, it actually called the process don't mind me, which was the which is the zeroth argument I passed using the dash A option. And then, so instead of saying sleep 10, it says don't mind me 10. So with this, you can hide process. However, you will not be able to hide the actual arguments after zero. So one through whatever will still show in the process table. So I was trying to find a way to do that. I didn't find a good one. Besides using anonymous pipes, which we'll talk about in just a second, because that's what all that other crap is. If you don't understand, um, like this right here, this generates an anonymous pipe using process substitution. And um, what that looks should look like, I think, if I um, echo cat say, um, I don't know, just give me some files. What do I got in my directory? Uh, do I test, t test. Okay, so that shows you how this, oh, if I didn't realize my trump, sorry. I was looking at this one. You can't really see that, guys. No, you can't. Okay, so now, what's actually happening here is process substitution. The process here that's generated, cat test, is then given its own file descriptor and the file this the output is then stored in the file descriptor and the file descriptor actually becomes the path that is then passed to echo right so in this way we're not really doing anything interesting because we're just echoing it but if it was the actual file like when we, when we can it because echo doesn't work with files right it, um you have to do with cat and then that will actually cat the value of whatever's in that um of that file so this is a case of, this is how process substitution works. So you can actually, one example of process substitution, getting a little off track, that is useful is doing remote diffs. So if you want to check out, yeah, if you want to check out the S, an S, or the, a diff of a file in this one system and a file in another system, you would use this. And um, can I give you an example? Do I have any systems that I can access right, access right now? You can just um, do a local diff too. I mean. that, that's true. Um, so let's do, well, let me show you how you would do it though with the, um, so you would do diff. I, I like these options, which gives the, the um, don't worry too much about white space. 
and also um, instead of the less than greater than to show you between or the which parts are which file, use plus and minus to find it's easier to read. You then you would do process substitution here SSH to my host here, right? And then you would uh, actually get the file from there, and then you would do another one. And the result is, say, hand me one. Actually, I could probably demo this. Um, yeah, Balboa. So we're going to do, we're going to cat the file SC SSH SSHD config. I think this will work. I think I have to do set up. So cat SC SSH SSHD underscore config. And what actually happens here is whatever whatever is the output of this process, that is then stored in a file descriptor via uh, the anonymous pipe. So a new one is generated. It starts with uh, usually. Um, Dev FD61, and I think this one over here for the second will then be 62, and the output of that, which is the actual SSHD config file, will be stored and accessible by that that pipe. So if we do this, logs in both systems. Once take well, yep, boom, we got the diff. So it actually worked. So we SSH into both systems. I had a public key set up, and you can see that. The first file was, you actually jumped up to 63, and the second one was 62, and the difference between the SSD deconfiguration on those systems were this file, the second system had allow groups NSM set, and a plug line, and a comment. And this one had, uh, well, that was the difference. That was not available in the other one. That was in the uh, NSM one. So that's an example of how you could use a process substitution and name pipes um, for solving things. And there was an excellent article, which unfortunately I forgot to comment, but um, name pipes that, oh gosh. It might be this dude. Yes, this, this article is awesome. If you check this out, I should have put this in the notes, but he shows how, um, Instead of doing something complicated like this, you can just use name pipes. And you know, well, actually, yeah, he actually creates uh, name pipes. So this is different from the regular pipes or passing data through. You actually have to create using MK5 the pipe. And it's just a file that has, you can see the attribute P for pipe. And then uh, you can then work with those. So he gives an example of using the two. And here he's actually just passing the file descriptor from the anonymous pipes here. And then it cuts down on the program quite a bit compared to the one above. And his big thing to take away was speed. Well, based on the data he was working with, which I think was biological data, is that um, instead of using a parallel process substitution, you, if you just write it to a file, you can actually write to the pipe, and it's actually part of the write to a file slower. You should write it to the pipe instead. So that's just something. Get a little off track. We'll go ahead and move on to the next thing. Oh, and uh, apparently I have that up there, and I forgot I put it there. Whoops. Anyways, we already covered that one. Um, Go on to Container City. We're talking about latest containers. I wrote an article. Okay, so I'm working on that island paper. We actually finished it up and we turned it in uh, to the Exceed conference, waiting for a review and hopefully it gets, it gets published. But um, whenever I was doing my testing with Docker, I noticed that when I was running hundreds and hundreds of containers uh, doing some particular task, they would fail using the device map or storage backend, which is the default in Ubuntu. And um, I did some digging around. It turns out there's actually this big um, bug, of, uh, basically a race condition between UDEV and device mapper that's in Docker. It actually occurs because since Docker is statically linked, like, you know, it doesn't rely on any dynamic executable, so the runtime linkers aren't really called to look all that stuff up. You can see I'm using an LDD in Docker until it's not dynamic. Um, it actually has, isn't, it can't have the code for UDEV all in that one binary. Uh, so that's one thing they skipped on, which I think because it was probably impractical. And second, though, I mean, because using the dynamic, because of this bug, I could do my tasks. So to run the hundred or thousand containers over and over and, and graph the data, I had to figure out a way to get it working with our device mapper backend because that's what I'm using for Islet. Because it's the only backend in Docker that, at sort of this, sort of this time that I'm aware of, that allows you to set the size of the disk for each container. Otherwise, someone could log into the container, type yes, and have it do a file and fill up your entire system and the host becomes unusable. So with Device Mapper, you can set like DM base size equal like 10 gigabytes, for example, that's the default. It won't get any larger than that. So I had to figure out how to do this and some suggestions on the mailing list were like build it dynamically. So I had to figure out how to build it dynamically, which is a pain in the ass, 
but luckily I've had enough hints and did some ass tracing that I could figure it out. But then I wrote an article on it. So if anybody's interested in trying out Docker and building it dynamically, you can. And essentially what I had to do was you know, I installed Golang, uh, the lib dev, mappers, and a few of the libraries. And then what I had to do, I hate that, it's really funny. Um, what I have to do this. What I have to do is, the big pain of this was, well, I don't know why that's not a lot of museum, but the big pain of this was I had to compile BTRFS from source. So the file system ride driver from source. So I needed these libraries. It took me a long time to figure out, figure out this because the documentation wasn't really too up to date. At least uh, I remember if I had some trouble with them. But I eventually got it to work, and because Docker kept doing for that, so that was a big thing. And I had to, I think I, you know, one time I modified the source to actually make sure that this value was set because in this one uh, upstream one it was not set, so that it didn't work. So you needed, as I say, you needed, uh, or it's not set in v3.1.rc2 version of that doesn't exist. You need this particular, this other one that has it. But essentially building it after you have all the dependencies real simple. Once you, you get clone Docker right here, you see the directory, and then you just do auto go path equals one dot slash hack make that as a dynamic binary and actually build the dynamic dynamic binary. And all you have to do is copy it over top of Docker and then, uh, into user bin Docker, varlib Docker init, Docker init, and user bin Docker init. And at that point it works. If you do Docker info, you can actually see it says UDEV sync support is true. Because in this case, it actually uses the UDEV libraries directly, and then it doesn't have that race condition because it can call its functions, which actually uh, mitigate this issue. Um, so just, that was that was a big thing for me because uh, it took a long time to figure it out, but I eventually got it working. So that's cool. Then all our tests worked, and I could make pretty graphs, which I'll show you guys later. They're somewhat pretty. They're not the greatest. All right, moving into the next section, uh, bin vicinity. So Here's a few cool things you can do in Vim. Let's go ahead and, and do um, this. So, well, yeah, it's be fun. So, you can do split windows. Uh, Lucia, I think you may have talked about some of that. I can't remember. I think I talked about splitting, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, this one uh, we can do start.txt, Vim dash, um, dash O and O. You can actually mold open file already in split windows. So, let's just open up. Um, a few of these, logiosgraph.txt, uh, skypod.txt, and uh, well, that's fine. You can see by start, Vim already opens them up in vertical split, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, if you want, just go a little slower. So dash O just means the following arguments are all files to open? And yeah, so these dash O, capital O is vertical split for all the files that listed after. And the lowercase O, which I'm doing right now, we'll do it in horizontal split. So you can see a horizontal right now. So you can add just multiple uh, after. And the switch between them, you do control W, and then you use the keys here. Oops, I didn't mean to open that one. So I can, so J, K to go up and down, right, and H and L to go left and right, and we'll demo that with the other one. Um, but first, before we do that, I keep hitting the wrong key. Let's go ahead and try it without that. So we're going to open Vim by itself. We're going to do Vim, we're going to do vertical split, VSP, and then what we're going to do is we're going to specify a file. I'm just going to use this right here. It opens up, right? And then I'm going to do control, uh, control W and L to move to the window on the right. And then I'm going to do another VSP. And then I'm going to open a second file with uh graph image right here. And then you can see that's there. And you can keep going. And you can throw a horizontal in there too. Um, SP for horizontal. And we can do install. Or what do I have? Um, this text. That's horizontal split. And I can do another down. Of course, this gets too ugly and I'm guilty. But yeah, you can divide them up like that. It's really easy. Um, that's a cool thing. Also, um, so that was these two items. This other one that I've that I've been using is uh, reformat lines by width. So, so I'm working on I'm co-authoring another paper, and this girl had it's in LaTeX. This girl had lines that were I don't it, it, pretty much the entire paragraph was on a single line, and it, it, my editor went all oh, over here. I had to scroll over right. It was ridiculous. And I was like, I need, and this was done for an entire paper, so I was like, I cannot read it like this. So I had to figure out a way to do this. And one way to do it, or there might be multiple ways, but this is the way I did. You set text width to 80. 
So let's go ahead and open a file. And this could be good for modifying any type of text document. Um, do I have anything that I would consider? Um, yeah, see that article I wrote. Okay, so speaking of which, so I work on, I'm working on an article for 2600 Magazine right now, which it should be, it got accepted, it should be coming out anytime soon. Because um, in April is when they do the new uh, the new season. So, but if you're interested, in check it out. It's an article on Islet. Here's the, the draft I didn't I wrote it in pen. Um, so you can see these lines are longer than 80 characters. So I'm going to set text width equals 80. And then what I want to do, I want to use V to highlight the lines I want to change, and I use G. I'm sorry, um, VQ. That's why I was wrong. Okay, so VQ. So I press, I would do V to highlight my lines and then I press Q. VQ. I'm thinking, gosh, I'm feeling. Um, and you can see it formatted all. If I want to do the whole file now to 80, let's accept, let's just do this. GQ, GQ, and you can see that they're all formatted to 80 lines. And I can take it back and now you can see that they're longer than 80 lines. So I'm talking about like this one right here. So that's kind of nice. Let me just do one more example. It was set the line to 20. Very, very small. I want to highlight this paragraph. Do VAP for paragraph and GQ. And you can see that it formatted it to 20 characters each. So this could be helpful in code too, possibly, if you don't have to worry about white space and you know, I mean like C for example. Um, so that's kind of nice. It's really nice for uh, HTML. Oh yeah, I guess like, yeah. I write, like I have a blog that I just write in HTML. Uh -huh. and it's really useful. Cool. Yeah, I guess each one be useful. Yeah, that's the idea. But does anybody else have anything to present? Uh, want to talk about or present on? No worries if you don't. Just curious. Oh, yeah, that sounds a nice tool. Uh, what VPN clients does everyone use on our Linux machines for Illinois Hat? That's the scope. Okay. Uh, I found out. I so I used to use the Avenue client, uh, and then they got rid of that. Uh, so then I used the AnyConnect, the Cisco one, for a while, but it was buggy sometimes. I just discovered uh, that you can use OpenVPN and OpenConnect, and they're uh, available in the Arch repos, uh, so definitely everything else. And it's way, way easier uh, and more reliable. You know what, uh, Rob? We should do a. We should add that to our documentation. Yeah, yeah. That might be interesting to some students. It's, it's like a, it's like a six, it's like a five line script just to create a tunnel, and uh, it's. I like it uh, infinitely better uh, than any connect and higher. Cool. So I'll add that to yeah. I, I tried using the uh, Open Connect, and well, that's what I use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Open Connect and Open VPN. Uh, and you, you, have, you have trouble with it? Um, it's kind of flaky, but I I've never really had too much luck with uh, VPN. The PPT one worked pretty well back when the four still used it. Okay. I'd love to try your script. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super easy uh, and it's been very stable. So, yeah. I'll have that tonight. Hey, does anybody else want to talk about anything so I can even buy the sushi? Today I uh, learned uh, a new batch thing, which is really low level, really easy, but I've never had a need for it. And that's assigning default values for uh, for variables where you, where you can get them as an argument to the script. Uh, so I've never needed that before. Like the one, two, like are you like where you, like you can say uh, variable name equals uh, dollar one or a default number, a default value that doesn't exist. Oh right, right. It's what the curly brace is. Yeah, you're yeah. Colon. It's the, the notation is uh, dollar sign curly brace. Uh, you can do dollar one for the first starting or one for the first starting, and then colon right. uh, minus sign, and then the default value. Yeah, just to talk, I got an example I've used a couple of those. Um, so. Here's a program that uh, Shell's going to run for uh, analyzing different types of logs and comparing it to intelligence feeds. And um, here's an example right here. So the default is if malware host URL, if the user, this is what the user specifies, it passes in by our, our argument. If that is not set, then it defaults to the actual malhost default, which I already have set in the script. So default. And that is uh, right here, that variable right there. So if that was not set, then it's going to uh, use the what the user specified, or what the user, that user specified is not set, it's going to use the default. 
Is that essentially what you do then? Yeah, yeah. I was doing it uh, not for like keywords, uh, okay. but just, but yeah, yeah. That's, and that was really useful for some uh, glue code that I wrote this week. So. Right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's definitely useful to, have to, uh, to know. I started writing a replacement for LS last night, but I couldn't get it ready in time. So. Oh, really? I'll probably show it next week. Cool. Now, what's uh, the, uh, do you do anything different with it? Is it? Um, it's just like it's easier to see like uh, file permissions and stuff. Okay. Um, You're doing back? Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> hey, I figured. Yeah. Hey, by the way, what was the reason you um, you were telling me that you used um, you like 10.4? What was 10? Was that right? Oh. Uh, so I got 10.4. Because I have a lot of PowerPC stuff. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and Leopard's really slow on PowerPC stuff. Okay. I couldn't remember if there was something specific about the uh, tools that it gave you that you liked. Um, no, I've just been using it really. I've been using it since it came out. Okay. Yeah, I actually got a machine now, uh, 10.4. Uh, uh, I think it's a G4 iMac or G5. Uh -huh. Yeah, let me know if you have any questions about getting stuff to work. I've been using it for a while. Cool. Anybody else? Learn anything new over break? Some of you guys learn something over break. I've been learning Lisp. It's fun. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's so, a functional language, right? What's that? It's a functional programming language? Uh, it's a multi paradigm. It's like, uh, so it can be, it's got full blown object oriented, uh, it's got full blown, that's it's got a lot of capacity to it. Are you using Lisp? What's that? Was it Lisp or what? I'm learning Common Lisp. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not very good at it yet, but uh, it's really fun. Do you know yet how similar uh, like ANSI list is to like e list? Uh, I don't. I'm just doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. That's cool though. Yeah. It's a lot different than anything I've done before. So yeah. You think a lot of it. I have a book on list, and I was looking at it, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> Some funky stuff. Hmm. It's pretty cool though. That's one thing I wish uh, Stallman had talked about. I know he's a he's a huge list fan. Oh, he has a, yeah, he's got a page on his website that talks about it, I think. Mm, that would be a good question to ask him. Oh, back to that. Like I said, he's not talking about technology, at least the way we're talking about it. I think I wish I now asked more questions about his personal interests. Mm -hmm. so it seems he like he was in interested in science fiction, huh? and he's really into politics now. So I'd be curious to you know, pick his yeah. brain on some of that stuff. Didn't come to me at the time, but I think that would have been, he would have been more approachable for those kind of, those kind of things. One more piece. Sorry, I already started, started using Blue Orders, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So, and I I might have actually, so I issued a ticket a couple of days ago. It might actually get to you eventually, but I, I think it's a, it has a number of our descriptor limit. Mm -hmm. Set to thirty-two thousand something, and I actually asked it to like increase if if it's possible to increase the number. Okay. And like yeah, like and and I the the, the response the initial response that I got so far is like no you can't. And, like, Do you know who said it? Uh, I think it was um, Brett, Greg, or Mark, Matt, maybe. I don't know. I actually went through like a multiple people and. Yeah, that won't actually go to me because I'm just security. Uh -huh. But um, they may talk about it. We have a ticket meeting tomorrow where we review all the tickets. Yeah. And they come up there and I'll, it'll be funny if I saw it. What are you using Blue Otters for? So uh, I'm doing a, a research from one of the professors in the computer science department. Basically, what we're doing is um, you know how like the school computer jobs are all like batch and like they're all kind of scientific workloads? But the, the research that we're doing is like, like if you're if you're trying to kind of adopt like a distributed key value store, which is like interactive, so it has to like respond in a matter of like a millisecond. So so in reality, right now it's it's kind of invisible to use like a supercomputer for like for these cases. But our assumption is that maybe uh, the companies like Google or Facebook, they're like just too rich. So because like, they already own like multiple data centers. If they build like a new data center and if it's cost effective and like it, if it's enough cost, cost effective, they might actually choose to build like a supercomputer to have like a regular commodity, like just kind of a bunch of commodity servers. So that it might be actually sort of a for some other use case. Mm -hmm. Not interactive to keep value. 
really kind of just testing the blue waters to evaluate the possibility. Cool. How are you liking your experience with it? Actually, so first of all, I had to um, I had to just like com compromise to use uh, the CCM instead of like the sending the job using the the app run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm kind of having having a hard time if it's even possible to like kind of port my binary to whatever that's compatible with non CCM. Like, what what's the what's the what kind of the distro the uh, CCM is running? Is it supposed to be? I don't know. I actually don't do much on the server. We just kind of monitor the traffic to it and uh -huh. stuff, and the log intensity. Yeah, so like the CCM is like like uh, the actual Linux, but the so most of the work codes that run on Blue Orders is like it's like a specialized compiled version, very like very specialized for like the supercomputers. So it's the the Linux Linux environments in the, the supercomputer. Doesn't look anything close to like a regular Linux. It doesn't have any kind of binary that I would like, nor normally use. So like, so I just like went with the easy way of like the file system is completely different. Or yeah, the file, even the file system is like it's like a it's called Luster file system. Yeah, it's like a parallel file system where like you have this like bunch of like thousands of storage nodes, which kind of take like like a thousands of my file. So whenever I ask for like uh, this portion of the file, he actually asks to like a bunch of different servers which actually stores the uh, the data, and then gives back to me like whenever all those all those storage servers like are like acknowledges the request. So the the advantage of that is that you have like a huge I/O of the throughput, but this disadvantage is like obviously like the latency is very like kind of unpredictable. There, there, are, there is like a, some, some sort of like spike in the latency. Yeah, if anybody's interested in parallel computing, um, like every month or two months, NCSA hosts like a workshop, and uh, they have instructors that will actually give you access to Blue Waters, a couple notes, and then you can actually they'll show you how to use uh, like Open MPI, Mass Special Interface Library, and Open AAC, and instruct you how to do basic HPC comp concepts and how to distribute your program. Or multiple nodes, so that's quite. Cool. It's free. A lot of it's free, and they'll provide you lunch too, so you get a benefit of that as well. Also, there's a project called Exceed, the Extreme Science Environment for Discovery and something, but I'm, I'm like funded for that kind of. And um, they have. You can actually just go on. I believe go on their website and register, and you can get access as a student to nodes and actually just do your own stuff. So check this out, um, Stream Science Engineering Discovery Environment, <clears throat> and check out the services, and you can actually get an allocation on it um, if you're a student, I believe, to run programs and get, if you'll get hands on experience with a supercomputer. Um, all right, so moving to the small talks here. Um, so you got anybody here using GNU plot? They're doing graphing? You have? Have you done? Have you done uh, uh, I had a hard time like yeah. working with GNU plot. I finally just moved on to like the matplotlib, the, the Python. Okay. I've never used it. I think I still need to know how to use like GNU plot. I, I don't I, I only still don't know like why people like use it over like Python or anything like that, but Well it, it is if you I mean I can't I'm I'm not like an expert on it or anything, I'm not even anywhere close, but I worked on this paper how to do all the evaluation of the software. And I ended up good and fine, ended up being my best friend for a couple weeks. So I'll kind of go through my experience with that. It's not for basic stuff, it's really nice. So we'll kind of talk about that going right now. Um, so GNU Pot is you know a GNU version of a plotting program, and it's a, it's a really nice one. You, just, uh, you can make really nice graphs in it, but you have to know quite a bit about it. There's a learning curve for sure. Um, and there's a free book online though if you're interested. Uh, uh, GNU Plot. Yeah, this one right here, I believe uh, this, I thought this was free. Maybe it's not. Um, hmm. Yeah, maybe it's not. But anyway, that's, uh, that is one you can get. Um, sorry, I lose my train of thought. Okay, so let's go to the um, islet testing directory. 
how about more data set? So we're gonna go to the startup test. So this is our test container startup times. And I have some I have some files here. Uh, so essentially there were just some shell scripts I wrote to write values to a file. And let's take a look on this is an Amazon EC2. So you can look at this and you can probably tell this is the load average from uptime, uptime, right? So I just did rough time uptime in a for loop after every time I run a container. And the first column, of course, at time is the the five second, the fifteen second, and or the uh, one the one minute, the fifth, uh, fifteen minute, or wow, one minute, five minute, fifteen minute average. So I want to graph one of them or all of them. So I wrote a GNU plot script. So or, in GNU plot, you have configuration files. You just tell it, hey, what do you want to do? What is the output? X and Y label, and where the data is. And in this case, the most of the time now, so you really can see graphing this only takes five lines. So here I'm going to graph it to PostScript. I want to use color. The output is going to be to this container startup the EPS file. And I want to give it the y-axis, the label Docker container startup time, the x-axis, the number of independent trials. And then this are the important part is the plot line gives the data. So we're going to give it, we're going to put in that text file that we just looked at. We're going to say using the first field, the first column, and points is the type of graph we want to do, it's just little points, and we want to give a title for that line. So how we're going to run this, we just do GNU plots, and then the name of the file, plot.cfg, just runs it, it generates got the output. Now, it, the file that we generated was um, EPS, take a look back on the plot script, and it's that container startup at EPS. Let me look at the screen. And I have a graph. So, and you can see that from the graph, um, the startup time for zero through 100 containers was all less than one second and less than 0.5 seconds. So the startup time using this Docker was very fast. So we just did a startup container, ran the command uptime to the 100 times, and then figure out the time for each one of those. So it's kind of useful. We're trying to prove a, a, a claim that's often made on the internet that we haven't really seen substantiation for. Like for example, CoreOS's website where it says containers start in uh, like a mil in milliseconds. So we, we didn't doubt it. We figured it was true, but we had to verify it, and then we did it here. So that's an example. Um, you can also modify it to do more things. So let's just change a few things. Let's change PostScript to PNG, right? We want to get a PNG file now. And we change this, oops, PNG. And do that. We run the same plot program. Whoops, uh, unrecognized terminal option. Oh yeah, PNG. The PNG one does not have the color option or argument. Here. Why am I hit? Okay. So now we do it, and now it generates the PNG dot PNG, and now we have the same version of the graph in a in a PNG file. You can do other formats. Um, so let's do one more example. We're going to graph the the load average for five minutes. So you just change two to that and then plot it, and then we'll actually have the five minute average. Whoops. Uh, open container PNG, and this one is the five minute average, right? So. Um, we can do multiple. Well, let's go to a different one to show you that. Though we can take a look here. Let's go. Let's go back. Let's go to ooh, storage types. Did I do a graph here? Nope, I did not. Okay, go back. All right, and now we're going to go to what's a good one? Uh, let's do concurrent. Let's test. Take a look at the plot file, and we're actually graphing three separate data sets or our data points. All from the same file, concurrent 2.txt. So the only difference really from the last one is that we added two more plot lines. And you don't do plot per line, it's one plot here and then three lines, and you have to break what line breaks or use the max or tell it to properly. It's not going to be on a different one. It doesn't fail. So here we actually graph load minute for our load average for one minute, five minute, and 15 minutes. It's real simple. So we'll go ahead and quit out. We're going to run a new plot and use that. Now it's generated, and we can take a look at the file it generated, and that was containerdensity.eps. 
for PostScript. And you can see there is the graph for that. So fairly simple so far if you're just working with, it's pretty much all we're talking about, is working with uh, a few columns. You don't really need to do any math on the columns, like median or sum or whatever. It's, uh, it's, very, it's fairly simple. You just give it the file, tell where the, where the data is in the column, and it graphs each one. How do you specify how the data was saved, like tab separated? Oh, good, good question. Um, so, oops. Where can we see the data? Standard density. Oh, current, I'm sorry. Current, current, current. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll show you. You can, yeah, you can change it. So, by default, it's white space separated. So you got five columns here. You can do any one of those. It probably failed this because of the, uh, the the slash in there. But you can have it handle that if you need to. Um, so yeah, so there's an option in GNU to tell you uh, the data what the separator is. So you can do different ones. And I'll show that next. Um, well, in a second. So let's go back here. Let's do let's mess with it a little bit more. So lines, right? So this time we're using lines instead of points. Let's try, well. Um, Does one mean the first set of data, like the first column? First field. First, first field. So, yeah, one, the field, the sum of the, 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 yeah, the first field, the second field, and the third field. So, white, value, white space, second field, white space, third field. Yep. And then what we're going to do right here is we're going to change this to points. And do the same thing. And, oh, she kept it open. Open. And uh, is it the same thing? I should have. Uh, I don't know why that one points line. Let's try a different one. Maybe that's the. No, container. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong file. That's why. Container density 2. There's a points, right? So that's lines or uh, points instead of lines. So let's keep it open. Let's play with a few more. So we're gonna do um, let's do lines points, I think. Yes. It may be the same thing as points actually. Um, one second. I forget about all. There's a way to view them. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Here's, here's another one. We want to do impulses. It's a fun one. Ah, right, damn it. Oh, I'm so, I know what. God damn, I'm sorry. With PostScript, you have to re, you have to reconvert it every time. That's why. That, the, the last one would have worked. Yeah. So there is um, impulses. And there's a few different other ones. I forget the command. Is it list? There's a way to. So by the way, GNU Plot's interactive. So if you just want to do it, you can do it all in here. Um, there is a way to list the. Um, Type line styles. I think that's it. Line style. Line styles. List line styles. Oh, all the clip. Can do plot list line styles. Wow. Yeah, there is an option. I've done it. I, I was looking through it. That's not it. Um, um, no, that's not it. Line, set, line, list, type, maybe. I don't know. I actually don't even know the link. Yeah, so anyway, we'll, we'll worry about that. But you can do it. Um, I don't use it enough to know it off the top of my head. So let's go to another graph now, though. Uh, we got a more advanced one, I think, here somewhere. So let's go to new and yeah. So if you, oh, I think I got this is making it easy. 
So one thing is you can see how it's a pain in the ass. You have to open the plugger config file up every time, change a few parameters. One can do plug again. So just make a shell script out of it. Has options, right? So um, here is me doing that. And see, so here are the actual off all the available boxes, steps, impulses, line points, pot, points and dots. And let's say usage plot. And you can just pass it to here dot with each one. So give me an example. So plot sh. So we're gonna say one. Uh, we're gonna do points and we want to do PNG. Uh, oh, you can't do color that. We'll do. EP. Oh yeah, let's use the. Well, I don't that. That needs to be added anyway. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna. And here's here Brian just talking about the data file separator. So by default, there's white space here. It's going to be using commas. So now I have the CSV file. So if you want to graph that, you can. I'll just show you. Um, perf 100, uh, one the rounds. You collect D, and we want to go to load, for example. And these are all comma separated values now. But we're going to graph those. And you can see that I'm doing three files from there from memory: 100 users, 200, and 500. And uh, we want to change. Actually, we don't even need to specify that one, do we? So let's go back to the uh, script. I'm sorry. File. And what we're going to do here is we just need to give it a round, essentially, I think. And then I'll do the default. So one, oops, plug in the sage. One. Uh, failing color, where are you at? Remove you. Okay. Now do it. Okay, now let's do this again. Again, sorry, uh, I haven't this up in a while. Let's go ahead and remove this to test, test.png. Um, and we'll be working with this file now. So plot it, uh, test.png. There's the file. Memory consumption, or no, this is system load process cutoff point, right? So now let's edit it again. Or we can actually specify something different. You can see your options. So let's just generate the same thing. We're going to use dots this time. Dots. Oh, oh yeah. I should have test that condition. Now you can see the dots. They're really hard to see there. Uh, let's do another one. Let's do uh, one steps. Steps. And then we can do. Sir, do you need something? I have a meeting. I uh, I have uh, this room from 9 p.m. I mean, oh. the next 10 minutes I can still. Oh, okay. Um, it's okay. I mean, I, uh, we are going to create exams, so until people show up, okay, you can use it. Okay, thank you. Um, we gotta hurry then. Blame that on Shane. She's one of the books in the room. Anyways, a few more. So we'll go ahead and um, I'll show you a few other ones that I've that quickly show that I've generated with different types. And then finally, I'll show a shell function. So here's one where you did a multi graph, or you did two separate ones. You just have two different plot sections in the graph. Here's one. Uh, this was using the impulses. And that's kind of what's cool, I think. And then um, this one's using the lines. This one is using the lines points. This one is using just the points. And this one's using the steps. So that's kind of nice. So you grasp for each one. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll move into. Does this support LaTeX for the legends and everything? I don't know. Um, yeah, I simply don't know. And um, that, I wrote a shell function so we can do. Um, Player f function name plot. So we're a little shell function to actually um, pipe data into GNU plot and standard in. So this way you can write little scripts and do it. And um, give me an example here so I got anything. Oops. Well, that's not now. Uh, using all that stuff. Um, so let's just do. So for I in uh, one through one hundred, echo I um, forgot to do. 
And so we do that, pipe that right into plot. And you got that. So you can do little things like that. You can do stuff with your system metrics. I can do up time, I suppose, and graph that data. You want to parse it. It's going to get ugly because it doesn't know where everything is. But um, you can parse all that out. You can do multiples of that and then pipe it there. Uh, I guess I can do, I don't know what else is good. Um, oh, hit maybe. Uh, <coughs> Uh, that might break text. Yeah, so um, of course you can grab the HP and then the, um, the line that said hit. Oops. I think that was. Oh, I must have. Yeah, there we go. This is the process ID. So you can, stuff, you can do stuff like that, whatever you want. I have this so I can make it easy on myself. That concludes the GNU plot talk, though. Um, so it's cool to mess with. Highly recommend checking that out. I'll, now we're getting into our big talk here on Influx DB and Grafana. This is our new systems. I, mean, I worked over spring break. So first off, all Grafana is awesome for making graphs look really pretty. So how we're doing this is we're running Influx DB. Influx DB is a time series database, right? So NoSQL. It is for storing time sense or time data very efficiently. You can, you know, you reduce the number of columns and store everything in, in, in rows, and you can aggregate things and break the rows to get a performance speed up. Um, so that's kind of how that works. So this is available. I, I, I can give it the password if anyone wants to play with it. You do have to proxy through our, our you follow the documentation of log through a proxy server to actually get access to this particular interface. Um, we have not running HTTPS. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. And it's actually talking to the API on port 8080. So it runs a few different ports. 8083 is by default the web interface. 8086 is the API, but we, I moved it to 8080 because from, from publicly accessing the stuff on the ACM network, I'm actually not, I, there's, there's filters on the firewall somewhere. I don't know if it's sites or whatever, but I had to use the 8080 and it allows me through. So connect. Whoops. And we have one database here now. And what we can do is we can query the data in the database. <laughs> so um, the data that we're actually storing here is from Collecti. Collecti is a really cool, we talked about it before, but it is a system metrics or stats tool that's written in C. It's uh, good for high performance. It's, it's, pretty, it's just a great way of doing system stats. And all it does, it just gives you the data. You have to figure out how to graph it yourself. So you install the install the, 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 the package. You can send the configuration files where to put it. And then you have plugins, or output plugins, to say what to do with them. In the GNU, GNU plot data, you saw the CSV files. Um, those were sits, um, collect the outputting to CSV as an output module. Also, um, there, there are other things it can do, though. And one of the things it can do is it can store data in the influx DB. And um, we are using the InfluxDB output module. So just to quickly break off here, let me show you. Uh, so log has Puppet up front, up and we talked about this. So let's just see quickly how all our systems get a hold of this file. Um, Vim modules, um, collect D, files, uh, or serve, yeah, log. So every system that we put up on our VM infrastructure sends their collect D data to collectd.gnu.log.org and influxdb.gnu.log.org. So we're actually running two graphing systems. We're running uh, Graphite, which is running on the collectd system, and we're running Grafana, which is running on the uh, influxdb system. So they're all getting the same copies of the data. And it's sending plug data for syslog, battery, CPU, disk, ethernet, memory, et cetera. And then the system, this actual um, server, the server one, yeah, we'll actually write that data on the ClickD server write it to a different database. In this particular one, it writes it to Graphite database. And Graphite uses Whisper. So we'll talk about that a little later. That's just another way to store it. But we're already getting InfluxDB in this case using the container. And um, we can actually query our data. So let's do that. Select star from, I'll pick a host, Docker, uh, memory, memory used, limit five. We get five results back. And then we have a graph of memory usage, right? So really nice. Uh, graph, um, CPU dash zero, CPU dash user, limit 100, right? 
and then we have a graph of 100 values. So you can do that. It makes it really nice. So this is this is cool. It's useful, and you can do all this stuff for all these different values. However, it's not the prettiest. So let's sort of return to Grafana. And we're actually using the new alpha version of Grafana. And let's go ahead and check it out. Grafana, like a new log. Or you can actually go to this. You guys will have to request an account for me, though. And I'll show you what we're going to look like first. So first, I have to build out dashboards. So these are the dashboards I built out, and doesn't that, shit, doesn't that look nice? That is sweet looking. So um, this is system load for all our systems running on our Zen project system. So you can go, you can put your mouse over top and tell you the load uh, for each one, and you can zoom in on one. So for Hammy, just click on that, and it just does the load for Hammy, and for each particular one. And uh, this is for processes running for every VM that we have. So as soon as you fire up a new VM, all the are already set up by a puppet and all that. So you, all this data is already sent here. You're going to begin querying it immediately. Then we do memory used here, and we got swap usage at this point. And then I got this one's not. I'm going to redo that one. But let's take a look at what it looks like inside. Um, so we can go to which is, which is an interesting one. Just do this. One. Edit this. Edit. So you can see here, we're matching anything. This is a regular use of the regular expression. Matches anything that matches load, and load is a value for all the systems in collect D. And then we say we're going to match, we're going to do like a where, where DSM is equal short term, so this gives you the short term load. And then, uh, which is essentially, uh, if we go back to the previous query, uh, DS name is right here. Or that wasn't the right, no, I'm going to load. Uh, Select value, load, load, um, limit, one, fine. You can see that DS name has different values, long term, short term, and midterm. You can't see all those, but if we do 20, you should be able to see enough. So uh, short term, midterm, and we're just saying where the value is, where DS name equals uh, short term. Yes, now we just have the short term load averages. So you have that, and then you have all the, the x, x axis and stuff, and then you have the display styles. And this is the easy stuff. So I can I can change this really easily to um, right there, it's no longer bar graph, right? Real simple. Now it is again uh, lines, points. It's, it's ugly, it's not used, really usable. But you've got all these different options you can play with. And then you can do like stacking and percentages. I don't know how to use all this stuff yet, but they do adjust, but it's more of a stacked view. That's kind of nice. Percentages, I don't see there isn't there any difference yet. But so this is kind of how it works. We can kind of play with the new one real quick. Um, so let's go to overview, or hand you want to hand me. So you can just create these different dashboards. So here's the, here's the system load average for Hammy. Just the host is the, the mid, or the short term, mid term, and long term graph. Let's add a new one. So add row, click this, add panel, graph, and then we click on this, we hit edit, and they want to do something. So um, I don't know, CPU, so we can start a expression here. And the cool thing about this, auto finds and completes it for you. So for different hosts, so I just want to grab. Um, let's do a Docker. Let's do everything from Docker one, all the CPU stuff. I want to look pretty, but okay, that's everything right there. It's a lot of lines. At that point, you can see it all in there. It's not really useful at this point because it's so zoomed in or zoomed out, and you won't see the lines unless you actually select a particular one. Like. And you can see that you can see the details. But there's different ways to handle that, and I'm not really good enough with it yet to know how to, how to do all that. Whoops. But yeah, so you can see how, how it's really how it's nice. And then we can do, uh, so let's just do nice. You click off, and then it graphs that. And okay, so that's, that's essentially um, Grafana. It's really nice to do all these things. And we'll have one for, uh, we'll have, we'll have, I'll build out these dashboards more and more. You're more welcome to try it out if you'd like. Now, I wrote some shell functions so I can do it from a command line. Um, so with the, with the API, and you can just use curl, right? So, you have this in the documentation. In, in logo or you can graph on because they're just C names, the same host. 
888 DB is collecting. If you also want to store your own stats up there, we can create a new database for you and you can put your own stuff up there. And we say where we want to authenticate, user, user, user root, password, which is a missed variable, so it wouldn't be on video. And uh, the actual query we want to use. So here we're selecting star from Docker 1, get the CPU IL stuff, and we're just going to get that value out. And this data is in JSON. Oh no. Um, why is that not right? I don't want to echo that value because it's going to show the password on the screen. Um, DB. Semicolon doesn't matter, right? I noticed you put that no, in. No, it, it only, which is weird, it only, work, it only matters when you have like a where clause. Oh, okay. But other than that, no, it doesn't. Good eye, though. Um, yeah, what is that? Is that? Oh, I know why. Because we killed all that shell earlier. there. It's exact. Uh -huh. That was the one I had to store and I didn't have exported to my environments. Oh, well, I don't care. Uh, everybody, the password is, um, you can all use it. A new log dash influx DB. So if you all want to try it out, there you go. Um, I can change it later too. So there you go. There's all the values. So I guess printed, I printed out 10 of them. Ugly. So I'm using JQ, which is a way to do J, parse JSON for the command line. I wrote a little other function because JQ is really ugly to mess with. To actually just do J, well, I could just, just a shell function as JQ. And I guess I can declare that. I'll show you that. Uh, J field. And it just prints, um, honestly, I don't even know how to read this. Uh, here's an array, this zero part, and then everything underneath that in the subarray, and then whatever value I pass into it. So these would be the fields. So um, J field, in this case, I think it's on two. Nope, it's not on two. It's on one. Oh, that's timestamp three, four. There it is. It's four. And um, I do have a bug in that I need to change, but uh, I need to fix. Well, you can see that, there we go. I can plot it now. Hold on, one of these times. Damn it. Damn it. What? Surely you would have, uh... nope. I thought I fixed this, but apparently I didn't. Okay, anyways. Um, oh, wait. I'm oh, sorry. Let me get. Well. Nope. Anyway, I thought I had fixed this. But, anyways, you can see that. Um, so, something's getting. We're not actually making the core request. Some value's getting changed and throwing the whole thing up. Um, but you can use this to pipe into GNU plots. So I should try to get over here. And, yeah, it's like, well, damn it, I thought I saw this. It was working earlier. I wonder if I did something else. Anyways, so this is how I, I was doing this, and then I was, I was putting it into GNU plots. Let's change it to a different one up for now. Uh, let's do Docker 1, memory, memory use. Let's see if we can get it to go. And let's limit to five. Okay, and J field. Uh, two, that was the two, I thought. Ah, there it is. We'll get lucky, maybe. I'm waiting to, to change back to those numbers. Well, this is a disappointment, guys. I'm, I apologize. Um, you work on that function apparently some more. But what we can do is let's just take a look. Oh, there we go. So let's just cat these into that thing. You can see the same thing, right? Um, plot. Uh, there we go. Right. Yeah, there it is, right here. This graph. And all the other ones failed, so they're, they're empty. Okay, got the point, guy. So you can see here's here's the graph of that. So I would do my own little, little graph by piping it into it for fun. 
I'll have to figure out what I did wrong in that. Any questions about this? I don't know anything about databases, uh, but uh, the InfluxDB is one type of database, and when you query it with that script, it converts it to a JSON object, and then you extract data from that object. Yeah, so what happens is Grafana, so the collect data gets stored in InfluxDB. Whenever you go to Grafana and say graph something, it then connects to the influx DB database via the API mm -hmm. and pulls out the data that you requested mm -hmm. and puts it in the graph. And whenever I'm but here in those examples, I was querying the influx DB database directly. Mm -hmm. So it's just it has a you know an excuse me, a web 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 based API where you can just you know use curl or Python and import URL the two or whatever and make your queries and get the results back. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can just handle them. So um, does that answer it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The other thing we have using the same data is Graphi. So it's another tool. You can all access this right now, by the way. It's not password protected or anything. Um, if you want to check out our systems, you can go to one, click on the system, and drill down. This is kind of how I go back and forth between the two. Because uh, this one actually shows you the folder view of the data from Collect D. So I'll go into one of these, and then I'll try to figure out how to, how to use the query in Grafana, for example, if I don't know what, what's available. And this one we're going to do load, for example. And oops, long term, mid term, and short term. I can do it right there. You can just click on this. That one's really nice. So this is cool if you're having projects and you need data uh, graphs and stuff for school or presentations or whatever you're, whatever you're working on. So that's just, that's kind of nice. So let's so let's uh, graph like, and that stores it in a Whisper database. It has its own thing. So we're doing both of these at this at this point in time. And we'll probably continue to do that because they're both useful in different ways. Um, I can't get over how good looking this is. How much overhead does Collect D has? Um, very minimal. It is very minimal. Um, it is, like I said, written in C. Now, you specify your interval. I think by default it's 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds it pulls all this stuff on the system and sends it. But it's written in a way that it. Um, it's very efficient about the polling, so you don't, every time it pulls, you don't see a spike real quick compared to like some other tools, like maybe Immunion, where it is five minute intervals and it runs all these shell scripts, which take a long time because they're slow. You know, and you can see that you can see the spike sometime on that. Um, but yeah, Collecti is made to be very efficient. All these machines are about brand Collecti and hosts with um, 512 megabytes of brand and one CPU without any issues. So it's pretty minimal. Is it? Did you install it with like a Brew package. Um, I have. I don't know if it's on OS 10, but um, these are all, all on our Linux host. Uh, it's in uh, Ubuntu and Debian. So app dash get install collect D will install it. And by default, it will write data out for you. Like you pretty much need to see where you want to put it. And the, like if you just want to have the CSV stuff, so it's easy with GNU plot, you can do that. So it, it's pretty easy to use. Literally, it's like editing three lines and you have data. You say what what was my host name or what would it want to show. Uncomment an output plugin, or if you want to send it across the network, uncomment the network portion and put the server you want to send the data to. So it's really nice. Um, go back to the thing as I did. I believe at that point we did. I can't think of anything else. Yeah, um, graph on it is very sweet. I highly recommend checking that out. If you guys want to apply this, let me know. And this one, I'm doing a stack graph. For pro number of processes running per host, and Hammy would typically have the most because it's the it's the VM server. If I click on that, it actually drills down for the particular just for that host, and so it's kind of nice. But I don't know, I really like that. So. Well, that's all. That's graphing 101. And how we're using it in the login stuff. So I hope we'll get more data and do some more cool queries. Does uh, do everyone in here use Image Magic a lot? I've never really used it. Um, it's one of the most useful tools for me day to day because I do a lot of data analysis, so maybe I can do a small talk on that sometime. That's a cool. Person. Do you use the command line versions of the yeah, tools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah, that's really good. That's like, a lot of yeah, there's a lot of, like, instead of doing open, you use display as mm -hmm. an effects, and it's way faster than using GPU okay. and stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah, it's got a lot of other things. So. Yeah, I definitely like to see that version. What's the name of the tool? What's that? What's it? Image Magic. You can get it from Purdue, uh, and it's 
uh, super, it's great for uh, converting images, resizing, all kinds of stuff. So. OS 10 has something, I think, uh, SOX or something? That, or no. Something. Yeah, I'm I don't know. OS 10 has some, some uh, image thing. Okay. Image converter? Yeah, but it, it's... I-C-U-M-B? That might be it. It, it, it. There's something that's like, it's probably not as advanced as image magic, but it's... Uh, I don't know. I see a lot of people talking about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming out, guys. Yeah. yeah. That concludes a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice. <laughs> uh, no, that's to you, but it's a DS. Yeah, no.